In the beginning, there was nothing. A vacuum, void, empty space. And in this empty space, there emerged a primordial fireball. Billions of years ago, this fireball exploded. This explosion generated all space, energy, matter. The universe expanded rapidly, producing electrons, neutrinos, photons, and quarks. Soon, this energy began interacting, forming protons and neutrons. Matter continued colliding and interacting. Over time, the first simple elements formed. These elements also collided as the primordial soup continued to expand. Cosmic and particulate evolution continued, and stars began to group, forming into the earliest galaxies. And then, just five billion years ago, something wondrous occurred. Within a cloud of gas in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, our sun formed. This new star gave birth to planets, moons, and asteroids. One of these planets, known as Earth, developed an atmosphere. Earth's environment, believed to be filled with volcanic eruptions, lightning, turbulent weather, mixed atoms and energy to create the first simple living cells. Then, through millions of years of mutations and natural selection, algae, jellyfish, and flatworms appeared. As evolution continued, fish appeared in the seas on planet Earth. Some of these fish developed into amphibians and through natural selection changed into reptiles. A segment of these reptiles evolved into a variety of creatures, including mammals. Some of these mammals became primates and then just 600,000 years ago, an isolated group of these primates evolved into man's earliest ancestors. This is our amazing evolutionary heritage. And evolution continues today as we evolve to our even higher destiny in the universe. Question of origins. How did the universe and all things that we see here on this planet come into being? Why do we exist? Hi, I'm Roger Oakland. Most of us have pondered these questions. And when it comes to the subject of origins, there are basically two views, the evolution theory and the creation theory. During the 20th century, the world was led to believe that evolution brought about all things. Our universe, the earth, and all life came into existence as a result of an explosion of matter in billions of years of time. However, there are others who believe the observable evidence points towards a creator. So how can we know? What does the observable evidence indicate? Both 
evolution and creation scientists have observed and agree that there is great variety within each species. Darwin noticed this variety and adaptability among finches. He noticed that the finch's beaks varied in size and shape, and that the beak's features affected the survivability of the finch. Today we notice a great variety of dogs. It is believed that all 450 breeds of dogs present today had a common ancestor. Most scientists believe that this ancestor was very similar to the present-day wolf. Scientists also witness natural selection, or survival of the fittest. Evolutionists and creationists agree that those animals that are the strongest, healthiest, or most adaptive to their environment are more likely to survive and go on to reproduce. The weaker animals, which are unable to adapt, are less likely to survive. We also observe gene mutations occurring. The DNA in all living organisms contains all the genetic information of life. Sometimes an error is introduced in this genetic code. This is called a mutation. Mutations often cause disease and can be induced by radiation, chemical agents, or replication errors. Mutations really do occur. They make all kinds of changes in genes. Uh, birth defects, disease, disease organisms, they're great at explaining the, the origin of disease, death, and disaster. Not at all at explaining the origin of something new, uh, some new trait that never exists. All the mutations we know about are only changes in genes that already exist. Darwin observed many things in, in nature. He was a good naturalist, a good observer of information. What he saw was various uh, plants and animals altering somewhat uh, through, through adaptation, through variation. Uh, he saw them uh, change. We never see one basic type of something changing into something else. That has never been observed in science or in, in genetics. It just has never been observed. What we see is variety. Variety happens, adaptation happens, evolution doesn't happen. Mutations, natural selection, adaptation. These are some of the observations that both evolutionists and creationists agree upon. But in spite of the agreements, there are substantial differences. And so the debate rages on. I mean, you have, you have such, such a wide variety of, of life. And I don't think it's possible for one person, I mean, no matter how powerful he might be, to just snap his fingers and create life. It has to come out naturally over millions of years, probably. Uh, I don't believe in the theory of evolution. Uh, you know, more and more, um, even secular scientists uh, are changing their viewpoints uh, because the evidence doesn't support their conclusions. Half of me believes in the theory of evolution, probably because that's what I was taught. Four years of studies, unfortunately, um, have kind of brainwash me towards evolution. We begin where evolutionists say it all began. With the Big Bang and the evolution of the universe. One interesting aspect of the evolutionary theory is that it's such, it's such a powerful theory and it's exercising such a strong hold over the imaginations of scientists that they've applied it outside the biological realm. They've applied it to inanimate things as well. They've applied it to the chemical elements, to stars, to galaxies. Uh, it's said that, um, that the universe itself is evolving. Did the Big Bang trigger the formation of galaxies, stars, planets, and ultimately, life? Is there any order coming out of a big explosion? I would say not in any way. Explosions cause chaos, and random distribution of various parts that were there perhaps as a, a united organization beforehand. Any explosion re renders that completely null and void. There is no evidence to my mind that an explosion or even the Big Bang Theory can ultimately produce organized beings like ourselves or any other animal. Evolutionary thinking is applied to most areas of science. The field of evolutionary cosmology proposes that the universe is the result of a random explosion some 15 to 18 billion years ago. There are no examples 
that I've ever seen where an explosion produced an increase in order. Explosions are destructive. They cause spontaneous degeneration, not spontaneous generation. Scientists recognize that all known explosions decrease order and structure and increase chaos. The idea that the cosmos evolved also violates the second law of thermodynamics known as entropy. The second law states that as time advances, the universe becomes less ordered. Over time, all systems left on their own proceed in a direction from order to disorder. All of us witness entropy every day as we see things age and deteriorate. This breakdown of structure directly contradicts the theory of evolution. Now the second law allows you to increase in order like a baby growing into adulthood or seed into a tree, but if and only if you have an outside energy source and a harnessing mechanism to capture that energy. Evolutionists don't have that. As Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is, there ain't no more. There is no outside energy source. So the second law is absolutely contradictory to the Big Bang Theory. What we see in cosmology is this. Everything we see, things are running down. Stars are burning up their fuel. Once in a while, a star will explode and goes from order to disorder very quickly. But the only thing we see in the universe today is the universe is running down. It's deteriorating. It's going from order to disorder. It's going to less and less organization. There is an observation that scientists make in every field of science, and it's generally called the laws of entropy. It's as if the universe was wound up somehow and is winding down. Scientists that study cosmology uh, talk about the ultimate heat death of the universe. Conceptually, it's quite clear from what we know that the universe ultimately sometime, billions of years from now, everything will become of uniform temperatures. There'll be no difference in temperature to exploit to get useful work. That the universe had to be designed and ordered in the finite past has not escaped the attention of secular scientists. NASA scientist Robert Jastrow wrote, the second law of thermodynamics applied to the cosmos indicates the universe is running down like a clock. If it is running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. The next obvious question is, who wound it up? Gordon Van Wylen addressed the question squarely in his book, Thermodynamics, when he wrote, the author has found that the second law tends to increase his conviction that there is a creator who has the answer for the future destiny of man and the universe. We only see destruction, we never see innovation. And this, I think, is what the creationist model has been posing all along, that in the beginning, things were very good. They were perfect, just like God wanted. But then, as sin entered into the, to the universe, and God's curse on all of creation because of that sin, the wages of sin is death, not only in the physical life, but in the universe, everything is dying. The, the sun is burning out, the moon's orbit is decaying. Everything is in this process of death and decay. Evolutionists and creationists agree now that the universe is finite. Space and time and matter had a beginning. Beginning with the studies of uh, Albert Einstein in the early 1900s on through this century, scientists are in agreement that space, time, and matter did indeed have a beginning. 20th century science, embarrassingly, has confirmed the, the biblical view because the great discovery in cosmology is that the experts have agreed that the universe had a beginning and the, uh, they call it a singularity. You see, the whole Big Bang idea really is, first there was nothing, and then it exploded. The fact that the universe is finite, that it had a start, is a, is a key fact, but a very, very awkward fact uh, for the evolutionist, because it really raises an issue they won't deal with, and that is what happened prior to that singularity. The creation model has always anticipated a finite universe. In the first verse of Genesis, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible also states that time had a beginning. In 2 Timothy, we read, 
God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amazingly, the Bible even explains entropy. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. If the universe did not originate from an explosion, the only other option is that it was created, an option that many scientists are not willing to consider. Almost all scientists would try to find a mechanical explanation of how the stars and the galaxies and the planetary system came into existence by purely mechanical means without any intervention of, um, of a god in creation. To my mind, they have utterly failed. If you look at the planetary system alone, there have been several explanations trying to uh, show how the planetary system came into existence without any preformation by God, and each one has failed uh, miserably. Many observations contradict the current theories on how the solar system evolved. The most popular theory holds that the solar system formed from an interstellar cloud of swirling gas and dust. If the sun, planets, and moons evolved from the same material, they should have many similarities. Yet each planet is unique. Since about 98% of the sun is hydrogen or helium, Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury should have similar compositions. Instead, much less than 1% of these planets is hydrogen or helium. If the solar system evolved, all planets should spin in the same direction. But Pluto and Venus rotate backwards, while Uranus is tipped on its side and rotates like a wheel. All moons in our solar system should orbit their planets in the same sense. But at least six have backward orbits. Furthermore, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter have moons orbiting in both directions. Growing a planet by many small collisions will produce an almost non-spinning planet, since the impacts will be largely self-canceling. Yet, all planets spin, some much more than others. Growing a large, distant, gaseous planet such as Jupiter or Saturn poses an insurmountable hurdle for evolutionists because gases dissipate rapidly in the vacuum of outer space. And even young stars, similar to our sun, do not have enough orbiting hydrogen or helium to form even one Jupiter. Scientists have no answer as to why four planets have rings, or why each planet is so unique. Theories on the moon's origin are also completely inadequate. The moon's elements are too dissimilar to those of Earth's, and its orbital plane and circular orbit offer strong evidence that the moon was created in its present orbit. There is no evidence that the planetary system could have come about by mechanical means. However, the more that scientists began to look at the amazing universe that they inhabited, they began to realize that there were certain factors that were simply very, very fine-tuned for the existence of man, of molecules, of organic life. And the more they looked, the more they realized that we are in effect on really quite a knife edge. And there are many, many indications that this universe has been very specially designed and man is at the very center of it. If we try to model the universe as we know it, as we try to build a mathematical model that reflects what we know, we quickly discover there are thousands of parameters and ratios that if you adjust, then even a little bit, life is impossible. We quickly discover that the Earth was a little closer, a little further from the sun. It's either too warm or too cold. If it turns at a little different speed, if the masses are a little different, it would hold too much or too little atmosphere. As you start trying to model this, you quickly discover that all the parameters involve an incredibly delicate balance. 
And so they call this the anthropic principle, meaning it's as if everything we know is skillfully designed or balanced for man. The Earth is at a very specific distance from the Sun. And they have calculated that if we were only 5% closer, the water would boil off from the oceans. If we were just 1% further away, then the oceans would freeze. And that gives you just some idea of what sort of a knife edge we are on. The surface gravity of the Earth is exactly where it needs to be. More, you have too much atmospheric pressure, less you don't have an atmosphere. Uh, the thickness of the crust is critical, the rotation period of the Earth, the gravitational interaction between the moon, strangely enough, has to be, is all these contribute to what makes life possible. And so they call that the anthropic principle, which collectively is an overwhelming argument for a designer. Scientists don't like to acknowledge that because a designer implies accountability. That the Earth was fine-tuned for the existence of life is no surprise to creation scientists. The Bible declared this fact thousands of years ago. In Isaiah we read, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Physicist and Nobel laureate Arno Penzia stated in 1992, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Astronomer George Greenstein stated in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit. The more we study the cosmos, the more the psalmist words ring true. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. For me to believe that all our life and our planets came from one big bang, I, I don't believe it. I believe, I believe there is a higher power out there. No, I do not believe that the universe has some sort of maker behind it. No, I believe the universe started with the big bang. I believe that Earth was designed for life because everything we see around us, everything we need to live, everything we need to survive and be happy is all around us. We don't, we don't want for anything, all our food, our air, everything to make us happy and to, for us to survive is here. So there had to be an originator of this. It couldn't just happen by, by chance. The evidence clearly reveals that God has created the universe and the solar system and specifically designed the earth for life. Yet many would rather trust and believe in the Big Bang rather than trust and believe in the God of the Bible. In the next section, we'll examine the possibility of life arising from chemicals spontaneously. Did chemical evolution on the primordial Earth produce life? According to evolutionary thought, all life, bacteria, fish, plants, animals, and men, originated from chemical compounds. This theory that life arose from non-living chemicals is called spontaneous generation. One of the fundamental laws of uh, biology is the law of biogenesis, that life comes only from pre-existing life. And of course, for a creationist, that's certainly no surprise. Life, God's life, created life to multiply after its kind. So that makes sense to a creationist. But to an evolutionist, there was a time in the past when there wasn't any life. 
And so chemicals somehow got together and made living things. And, and this is, uh, was often called a spontaneous generation. And there have been some enormous problems faced in trying to get a group of chemicals to, to, to come to life. A few years ago, Stanley Miller did a, a famous experiment. He took some simple materials, uh, some methane, some ammonia, uh, some water vapor, uh, zots them with an electric spark to simulate lightning flashing back and forth in the atmosphere of the ancient Earth. And in just a week, he got amino acids, the building blocks of protein. And that was hailed as almost making life in a test tube. That was one I used when I used to teach evolution. But I took a look at the rest of the evidence. And there are three problems with that brilliant experiment. One, he had the wrong starting materials. Uh, two, he used the wrong conditions. And three, he got the wrong results. Other than that, it was a brilliant experiment. The Miller experiment assumed an atmosphere of methane and ammonia, gases that could not have been present in large amounts because the ammonia would be decomposed by ultraviolet light. And methane should be found stuck to ancient sedimentary clays, but is not. Miller also left out oxygen because he knew that oxygen would destroy the very molecules he was trying to produce. But as deep as we dig, we find oxidized rocks, suggesting an oxygen-rich atmosphere. The Earth did not have a reducing atmosphere, say an atmosphere of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen that was suggested in the Stanley Miller experiment. Uh, they never, the Earth never had such an atmosphere. The, Geology is now clear. There is good evidence that the Earth has always had oxygen in its atmosphere. Now that would absolutely preclude any evolutionary origin of life. Miller also used the wrong conditions. He used an electric spark to combine the gas molecules. The problem is that the same spark that puts amino acids together also tears them apart and it's much better at destroying them than making them. The problem was the, the chemicals put together, the amino acids in the flask, would also be torn apart by the very spark that put them together. Miller knew that as a biochemist, and so he circulated the gases, trapped out the molecules he wanted using a well-known biochemist trick, but that would be cheating because you were supposed to say this is how life arose before there was a, any intelligent design to preserve these molecules from that destructive force, wrong conditions. Then he got the wrong results. The main product of the Miller experiment was tar, a nuisance in organic reactions. Trace amounts of several amino acids that make up the proteins in living things were also produced. The problem is that Miller's experiment produced both left-handed and right-handed amino acids. Only left-handed amino acids make up the proteins of life, and just one right-handed molecule prevents their production. What Miller actually produced was a poisonous brew that would destroy any hope for the chemical evolution of life. You might say, well, if what I've just said is true, what about all the evolutionists that believe in this? Well, interestingly enough, the evolutionists would agree with me. Uh, there was a time I was at a debate at San Diego State University. I was just in the audience. But uh, two friends of mine, Dr. Henry Morris and Dr. Dwayne Gish, were doing the debate for the creationists. And at the end, uh, somebody in the audience noted, ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged this evening. We have in our audience Dr. Stanley Miller. And Gish had explained why Miller's experiment would not produce life from non-life. And so the, the person asked Dr. Miller, would you like to respond to what Dr. Gish said about your experiments for chemical evolution? And Dr. Miller said, no. <laughs> he hasn't believed in that for decades. He knows all of those same problems. I would say this, any theory on the origin of life on the Earth, or any other planet as far as that's concerned, is a fairy tale. The case for chemical evolution only weakens when we consider that long chains of specific amino acids all in exactly the right position are required to form the proteins of life. Even worse, amino acids do not naturally link up to form proteins, but rather tend to break down. Now, proteins can be two or three thousand amino acids long, very long complex chemicals. And they're very much like a computer program. Every 
amino acid has to be in exactly the right position. If one of them is wrong, then the whole um, protein is useless, just like a computer program. The improbabilities buried in Darwinism start right at the very beginning, even before life began. How did, uh, how did the first protein molecule come about? And there's been quite a bit of work done on this to investigate the probability of it, um, work both by information theory technologists and also by um, molecular biologists actually tinkering with proteins to see whether or not they can be taken to pieces and reassembled. And the work of um, both groups has found that the probability of a, a protein of the sort of size that you find in the human body coming about by chance is so great as to be virtually impossible. It's something which is, yes, it is possible if you have eternity at your disposal, but Darwinists just don't have eternity at their disposal. Information theory scientist Hubert Yockey calculated and MIT biologist Robert Sauer confirmed that the probability that a protein containing just 100 amino acids would form spontaneously is less than one chance in 10 to the 65th power. An event so improbable that it could be compared to winning the state lottery by finding the winning ticket in the street and then continuing to find the winning ticket in the street every week for a thousand years. The origin of the very first animal life out of ordinary chem complex chemicals is so large that no evolutionist has ever been able to overcome it and it is one of the biggest barriers to the theory of evolution that I know. Even if proteins miraculously formed, we still are not close to producing life. The simplest living cells require thousands of specialized proteins in order to function. A number of scientists have tried to calculate the probability of life arising by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle, a British mathematician, using a supercomputer and the assistance of graduate students, estimated only the origin of the proteins of an amoeba, 2,000 of them, arising by chance. He estimated that the probability that the proteins of an amoeba could arise by chance is one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. A probability of one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power is absurdly small. To illustrate this, consider the probability of snatching a particular atom out of the entire universe is one chance in 10 to the 80th power. After making this calculation, British mathematician Sir Frederick Hoyle stated, the likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 noughts after it. It is enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor any other. And if the beginnings of life were not random, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. We can prove mathematically that evolution is, is just a joke. It couldn't possibly happen. Richard Dawkins, for example, uh, one of the leading evolutionists in his book, uh, The Blind Watchmaker, he acknowledges that the nucleus of every cell, plant, animal, or human, has a database larger than the 30-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. All life, plants, animals, and man, are made up of cells. Each cell is a miniaturized city performing the complex functions required for life to exist. The cell membrane is self-repairing and consists of special proteins that monitor what is outside of the cell as well as select which molecules are allowed to enter. These proteins act as pumping stations controlling the import of nutrients and the export of waste materials. Inside the cell, we find staggering complexity. For example, the endoplasmic reticulum is a transportation network with protein-producing factories called ribosomes. The ribosomes produce many types of specific proteins, while the ER channels them to precise locations. The Golgi bodies transport proteins to the exterior membrane, while lysosomes act as digestive organs that break down and recycle larger molecules into particles the cell can use. The mitochondria are the power plants of the cell, producing the fuel that the cell consumes. The nucleus contains the data center, which governs cell activity. 
Inside the nucleus, we find the chromosomes, which contain the DNA molecule that functions as a library and contains all the coded information needed for life. Billions of instructions are coded on this error-detecting and error-correcting self-replicating molecule. Only if all of these structures were created simultaneously could a cell function. For example, to produce DNA, a cell requires more than 75 different types of proteins. Yet, these proteins are only produced at the direction of DNA. The only solution to this dilemma is creation. The odds of getting DNA making protein on a roll of the molecular dice is like the odds of getting a 13 on a pair of gaming dice. The potential is not there. The probability is just plain zero. Evolution teaches that bacteria were one of the first life forms to evolve from chemicals. Many bacteria propel themselves with a type of miniature motor called a flagellum. These extremely efficient reversible motors rotate up to 100,000 revolutions per minute. The bacterial motor is similar to an electric motor. It has a filament that acts as a propeller, a universal joint, a stator and a rotor, and a drive shaft with bushings. Each part of the motor must function or the bacteria will die. Since bacteria can start, stop, and change direction and speeds, they must have sophisticated sensors, switches, and control mechanisms. All of this is highly miniaturized. Eight million of these motors would fit in the cross-sectional area of a human hair. While bacteria are small, they are not simple. You know, I think probably the weakest link in all of evolution theory is the idea of the origin of life from non-living chemicals. It's probably easier to get from a cell to a person than it is to get from chemicals to life. Uh, the, the gap there is just so incredibly large. I'm convinced that life is so complicated, so complex, so intricately engineered that wherever life exists, God created it. It could not have come by natural processes. Life comes from a creator, and that creator tells us that he created life here on Earth. Here we see it, unimaginably complex, it must have been created. I believe humans evolved to where we are today from single-celled organisms based on the, the theory of Darwinism and natural selection. I don't think that there was any sort of divine intervention. I believe evolution is um, pretty much a proven theory. I don't believe in a higher order. Um, just because the fact that I haven't seen any, you know, proof or you know, concrete evidence of that, and until somebody shows me you know that there is, then I'm going to have an inversion to organize religion, and I'm going to stay on the basis of chemical evolution. No life is simple, and all life shows the handiwork of a designer. Scientists know this, yet many believe in chemical evolution rather than be accountable to the creator God of the Bible. Next, we will examine the evolutionary view that simple life has evolved into complex life. Assuming that life miraculously appeared on Earth, is it possible that single-cell life evolved to become all the complex plants and animals we see today? That was Darwin's idea that everything, every living thing on the Earth, eventually could be traced back to a common ancestor. The thing that Darwinists believe is that life, that all the species on Earth have, have evolved by a process of spontaneous genetic mutation, that's a spontaneous change in the DNA which is the program for every living thing, coupled with natural selection, the survival of the fittest. The extraordinary thing is that although the theory has been pretty well accepted universally for over a century now, there is absolutely no direct evidence to support it at all. Darwin made a big deal about the fact that there were various sizes of finches, small, large, medium-sized finches. He made a big deal of the fact that there were finches with uh, large beaks, 
thick beaks, long beaks, and thin beaks. Darwin assumed that these beaks were evidence of evolution. In fact, these beaks were the result of the genetic variability that already existed in the population. If you take two medium finches with medium-sized beaks and you breed them, you will get some finches with small beaks and some finches with larger beaks. Over time, as these finches spread out into the various environments, certain beak sizes would be favored in certain environments and therefore they would become the predominant type. But the point is, is the capability to produce the small beaks, the medium beaks, and the large beaks was already in the parent population of the Galapagos finches. And it was simply the environmental differences that allowed them to be expressed. It was not the creation of any new and unique information. The trouble is that all these finches actually do interbreed. And that is the, in biology, this is the test of uh, a species. Uh, two creatures which can breed and uh, produce live fertile young are regarded as being belonging to the same species and all the Galapagos finches meet that criterion so there are not many many species. If evolution was true we wouldn't be concerned about the extinction of species there'd be new ones being created we don't have new species we got deterioration we have all kinds of species that no longer exist. Charles Darwin theorized that given enough time one kind of animal could evolve into another. This is the basis for the evolutionary tree of life taught in biology. Yet Darwin himself acknowledged the lack of transitional fossils in the rock strata. Darwin wrote, Intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The key problem with Darwinism is finding hard physical evidence. Where would you look for that evidence? Well, obviously in the rocks, in the, the record of the rocks, the fossil record. Fossils have been collected for hundreds of years, for centuries. There are billions of fossils in every university and every museum in the world. But there are no intermediate species. You look at one strata and you find one kind of fossil. You look at the strata above it and you find a different kind of fossil. You don't find, what you don't find is a gradual change. One of the greatest evidences for creation is found in the fossil record. For example, in the so-called Cambrian rocks, we find a, uh, fossils of a vast array of very complex invertebrates, clams, snails, jellyfish, worms, brachiopods, trilobites, and many other very complex invertebrates. But nowhere on the face of this earth has anyone found fossilized ancestor to a single one of those complex invertebrates. Now that fact alone demolishes the theory of evolution. Evolutionists claim that these invertebrates in turn evolved into vertebrates, such as fish. However, over the last 150 years, scientists have unearthed billions of invertebrate and vertebrate fossils, and they have not found a single transitional form. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed, no trace of ancestors, and certainly no trace of transitional form linking these major kind of fishes to one another. Now that fact is known, evolutionists know that. Now the fact that we have no ancestors for the fishes, the vertebrates, we have no ancestors for the invertebrates, means that we didn't have any ancestors, and evolution is impossible. A study of the geological record confirms that the major groups of animals each appear abruptly and fully formed. For example, within the insect world, there is enormous variety and complexity. Yet evolutionists offer no conclusive evidence that any of the insects evolved from a common ancestor. The same problem exists for all of the great variety of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. The evolutionary tree of life has no trunk nor branches. Therefore, all of the implied intermediates are only blind speculation. Sometimes um, Darwinists hold up examples of what they say are transitions. For example, I suppose the, the best known example is Archaeopteryx, which appears to be half dinosaur, half bird. The trouble is, when you look at the dinosaurs that it might have evolved from, what you find is that none of those dinosaurs had a collarbone, and birds all do have a keeled breastbone which holds the pectoral muscles which enables it to flap its wings. It has been claimed in the past 
that Archaeopteryx was really nothing more than a feathered reptile. Well, I've never seen a reptile yet that you just stick a bunch of feathers in and kick it in the tail and it flies. And no, Archaeopteryx flew. He had wings and he certainly wasn't a feathered reptile. As a matter of fact, I have an article here before me published in March 1996 in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And the authors say this, the avian features of the skull demonstrate that Archaeopteryx is a bird rather than a feathered non-avian archosaur. The most important missing link of all, of course, is the missing link between an ape-like ancestor and mankind. That's the missing link that most of us are interested in. Have, have we found that? Well, if you listen to Darwinists, you'd think that we've found lots of them. In fact, the evidence really isn't there at all. All of the fossils that have been found so far have been classified, reclassified, either as human or as ape. And so far, the missing link is still missing. I have been investigating the so-called missing link between man and ape for many years and I have found that every single one of them um, simply is no link whatsoever. For example, Australopithecus, the uh, skeleton of Lucy, this really consists only of a 40% skeleton of a not very large ape and they have not got any evidence that it ever walked upright in any of the bones that they have found of that skeleton. The interesting thing about that is that Lucy is shown as being distinctly human-like. She's very erect in her posture. She's got human-like hands, human-like feet. Uh, I'm not quite sure where exactly the restorers got this data from because if you examine the paper by Randall and Sussman which described the type species to which Lucy belongs, they said quite clearly that she had long curved hands and feet, even longer and even more curved than a chimpanzee. Um, several distinguished anatomists have reached the conclusion that, for example, Australopithecus, the genus to which Lucy belongs, was simply an extinct ape, nothing at all to do with humans. If we analyze the so-called missing links, we find a trail of fraud, deception, and speculation. For example, Nebraska man was reconstructed, family and all, from an extinct pig's tooth. Piltdown Man is now universally known to be a deliberate hoax, consisting of an ape's jaw and a human skull, doctored to look old. Neanderthals were just plain people, some of which suffered from arthritis, rickets, or syphilis. Ramapithecus, Gigantopithecus, and Zygantropus were just apes, while Heidelberg Man and Cro-Magnon were completely human. So, despite evolutionists' misleading claims, the missing link is still missing. One of the more amusing things you hear these days is that uh, the DNA of man and chimpanzees is 98.3% identical. And I have to admit, as a geneticist, I find that kind of humorous, that you're not even that closely related to yourself. And so the genes you inherit from your mother, the genes you inherit from your uh, father, uh, are on the average at a maximum only 93% similar. Scientists claim that the hemoglobin of a chimpanzee is 98% the same as the hemoglobin of a human being. What they don't tell you is there are many other organisms, including slime molds, that have hemoglobin, which is also very similar to the hemoglobin of a human being. Now you would expect a lot of similarities between man and chimpanzee. We breathe the same air, we have muscles and bones, we digest things similarly. If we were created by the same God, we would expect to have lots of similarities. But let's suppose for just a moment that there, there was some truth in that figure, although I haven't got a clue where in the world it could have come from. Uh, a cloud is 98% water. A jellyfish is 98% water. A watermelon is 98% water. To use evolutionary logic, there's no difference between a cloud, a jellyfish, and a watermelon. <laughs> Those 2% difference really make a whale of a difference uh, in man and chimpanzee. In the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that God created every living thing according to its own kind to reproduce and fill the earth. This is exactly what we see. If, as evolutionists claim, a reptile evolved into a bird, who would the first bird mate with? Furthermore, all intermediate forms would be fatal. What good is half a wing? or half a beak. 
All animals have complex organs required for their survival. For instance, dolphins and bats have a sophisticated sonar that they use to locate food. Unless these highly efficient sonar systems are fully functional, the animal dies. Certainly, the scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports the creation model, while evolutionists are forced to admit that from their perspective, both the origin of life and the origin of the major groups of animals remain unknown. Complex body structures that we have probably did not come from the evolution. Maybe it did. It's really hard to decide which one it could be. To me, again, it takes more faith to believe that all these perfect conditions came together at the right moment to allow all these complex aspects of life to, to come into being and to come into existence. And to me, there's, it takes a lot more faith to believe that hogwash than it does to believe that there's an awesome God that created us. Evolutionists are trying desperately to hold on to a failing theory rather than to acknowledge the creator God of the Bible. Despite this, the evidence continues to mount to support the creation model. But how can we know that the God of the Bible is the creator? The scientific evidence in this century has indeed proven that space, time, and matter is finite, and it tells us that the creator must be a being who's independent of space and time. Only the Bible teaches the notion of a finite universe and a creator who is fully transcendent. That is, he's independent of space and time, but he can also act within our space-time domain. No other holy book on the earth teaches such a creator. If you look at any of the other religious books, all of them present, presume, a three-dimensional universe and a three-dimensional God. And that's amazing to realize that only the Bible has, as its distinctiveness, a transcendent presentation. For years, the astronomers believed that there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 stars. This held in the science of astronomy until Galileo came along with his telescope and suddenly science realized that the stars of the heaven are innumerable. Billions of galaxies, billions of stars in these galaxies, innumerable, just like God said to Abraham, way back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Throughout the Bible, we find insights about the physical universe that the scientific world has only recently discovered. For instance, in the book of Jonah, we read, The water compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. In this amazing verse, we are told that there are mountains on the ocean floor. Yet scientists did not know this until this century. In the book of Job, Job proclaims that God hangs the earth on nothing. While many holy books declared that the earth sits on the backs of turtles or elephants or is held up by Atlas, the Bible alone declares what we now know to be true. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we read, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Only recently have scientists discovered that everything in the universe is made up of subatomic particles that are indeed invisible to the naked eye. Certainly these authors were inspired by the creator of the universe. I challenge anyone to find scientific errors in the Bible. They're not there. What's fascinating to me is the more you know about the scripture and the more you know about contemporary science, you discover that the Bible has anticipated. As a Christian, we can believe in creation and the laws of science at the same time. And as a scientist, I'd a lot rather believe a theory that fits with the evidence that we can really see. Always, whenever we study, whenever we really can observe, we'll see that science supports God's Word. I would challenge those who are declaring that the Bible is filled with myths 
to investigate for yourself with an open mind. And I know you'll discover the truth. A question of origins. We've examined the evidence. Now it's up to you as an individual to make a choice. In the book of Romans chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the evidence that God has created is so obvious from the things that God has made that if you reject that evidence, you are without excuse. And in the book of Colossians chapter 1, the Bible tells us who the Creator is. Not only that He has created all things, but that He has redeemed us from our sins through His death upon the cross at Calvary. The Creator is Jesus Christ. Will you acknowledge that you have been created? Will you recognize that you have been separated from the Creator, Jesus Christ, because of your sins? Will you accept Him, who He is and what He's done, and who you are and what you've done? It will be the greatest choice that you could ever make for eternity. The subject of origins is a controversial issue. There are basically two views when it comes to looking at the idea of when things began, how they began, and what took place during this process. Evolution is man's speculation on the subject of the origin and the history of life. As no human being was there, the evolutionary idea is based on man's ideas of what could have happened but not based on any observations. On the other hand, the creation worldview is based on a biblical revelation. That is, if you are a biblical creationist. And the Bible gives us some insights into what took place, 
and then we can go out into the world and we can see whether or not the biblical model can be supported by the evidence. Now as I begin tonight, I want to share just a short word of testimony with you. For many years of my life, I did not believe in the creationist view. I believed in the evolutionary worldview. In fact, I taught biology from that perspective. About 14 years ago, some changes took place in my life. I became a creationist, and then several months later, a biblical creationist, and then a Christian. And today, I stand here as a representative of God's grace in my life, as I now have come to realize that this book really is true and that it can be supported by the observable evidence. And tonight, as I begin, I want to turn to the book of Psalms and just read a few verses which basically summarize exactly what I believe at this time. We can turn to Psalm 119. And looking first of all at verse 105. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet. It is a light to my path. In verse 130, The unfolding of thy words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And verse 169, let my cry come before thee, O God. Give me understanding according to thy word. So a biblical creationist looks at the Bible model on the subject of origins and then looks at the world to see whether or not there's evidence out there to support it. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at the foundational principles of creation and see whether or not they can be backed up and supported by the observable evidence. According to the Bible, the beginning began this way. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So according to this account, there was a supernatural beginning of all things. An all-powerful creator God, a designer, planner, brought things into existence. And of course, the scriptures say he brought into existence the heavens and the earth. And as we look at this, we can simply state God created everything which exists in the universe. He created all of the stars that we see, the Milky Way. He created our solar system. And of course, he created the planet Earth. But there is also another way of studying the various words that are used here in Hebrew, which give us some further insight into what God is telling us what he did. You see, any constructor, any designer, any building builder would begin with building blocks. And that's what God did. He began with building blocks, and he's telling us how he did that. Everything which exists in the entire universe is made up of atoms. Those are the basic components of everything that we see. And notice atoms are made up of three components, space and matter and energy. And when we study Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we see that that's what God is telling us. He brought into existence, first of all, space, which is the Hebrew word shamayim, which is the word heavens. He brought into existence the substance from which things are made, or matter, which is the word earth, or the Hebrew word eret. And the Bible tells us that this earth, or matter, is without form or void. It hadn't been brought into any meaningful form. And so we could compare this to a stack of Lego blocks that have been tossed haphazardly on the floor without order, without form. And on the right-hand side, we see where they have brought into some meaningful existence, into some design. And that's what God did. He took the matter and he formed meaningful matter or atomic structure by bringing in the third component, energy or light, as the Bible describes it. And light is not just the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see. Light contains all of the various wavelengths of energy that we know about in the universe, the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we have energy, we have matter, and we have space, or the three building blocks of atoms which make up everything which exists in the universe. Another important principle of the creation model is that the Bible tells us that God did something very unique with water. His spirit moved upon the face of the waters. 
And we know that water is absolutely essential for life. You cannot have life without water. We can see that water has many unique characteristics, unique to other components or other elements. So God did something unique with water, and we see that it lines up again with the observable evidence, water being necessary for living things. Now we move on into another important phase of the creation model. According to the biblical view, the original earth was very different than the earth that we know it today. We can turn to Genesis chapter 1 and read from verses 6 to 7, which gives us an account and tells us what the original earth was like. It appears that the original earth was surrounded by some kind of a water form around it. Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. Now many people have read these verses and wondered, what is it that the Bible is describing? It's very simple. According to the biblical account, the original earth was surrounded by some form of water. Now this diagram, which we're showing you here, certainly is not attempting to be drawn to scale, but what we're illustrating is that the earth in the original form was encapsulated or surrounded by water in some form. And we're told that the waters above separated from the waters below by a firmament or an area where the birds fly, we're told in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20. So this water layer, and we can call it a water canopy layer, was above the earth, separated by the firmament, and created a totally different condition than anything that we know of today. Perhaps it was somewhat similar to the ozone layer that we have today, which is a surrounding layer around the earth which protects our environment from shortwave radiation. But this condition, this water vapor condition or water condition, would have created a greenhouse effect which would have created a totally different environment than anything that we know of today on our planet. You see, in a greenhouse today, light travels through the panes of the greenhouse and creates a condition where plants or animals could live in a very vigorous condition and grow vigorously. The original Earth, protected by water, would have allowed the radiation from the sun, the long wave radiation from the sun, to go through and also create a greenhouse or a terrarium condition. The original Earth would have not had the extreme climatic conditions like we have today. It would have been subtropical, literally from pole to pole. Today there is an unequal heating of the Earth's surface. And the polar regions heat up or, or do not heat up as much as the equatorial regions. And as a result, you have high and low pressure masses being created, and they tend to equalize each other causing wind and rain. In the original Earth, because this condition existed with the water vapor layer surrounding it, there would not have been low pressure and high pressure masses, and there wouldn't have been any rain. And it's interesting that the scriptural account tells us at this period of time there was no rain, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 6. But a mist used to rise up from the Earth and water the whole surface of the ground. So a mist came up from the earth, and that would again line up with this model, a greenhouse condition or a terrarium condition that existed in the original earth. Another important factor is that the water vapor layer would have protected the earth by filtering harmful short wave radiation, somewhat like what the ozone layer does today. It helps to filter ultraviolet radiation, which causes the breakdown of cells, the degeneration of life causes mutations, causes cancer. In the original Earth, this water layer protected the Earth from harmful shortwave radiation. And so life living under these vigorous conditions would have been able to live longer. And if it lived longer under these conditions, very likely it would have been able to grow larger. Now, if this model, the biblical model of origins, based on a canopied Earth, has any validity, there must be some supportable evidence that we can point to from the fossil record. And indeed, there is supportable evidence. As we look at the fossil record, we find that all over the world, we find subtropical forms of life existed in the past. 
For example, we could go to northern parts of Canada where these palm tree leaves were found and they've been fossilized, encased in basalt, that's volcanic rock. Now palm trees do not grow in northern Canada in a natural condition today. In the past, they did. And there's evidence to support that. We could go to even more extreme northern regions of the planet. For example, to the new Siberian islands, which are within the Arctic Circle and only a few hundred miles from the North Pole. Here, some of the first discoverers were amazed to find fruit trees 60 feet tall with fruit and green leaves frozen in the ice. Or we could go to the Spitsbergen Islands, where palm trees have been found there as well, and the fossilized remains of marine organisms of subtropical varieties, including coral, which only lives in regions of water somewhat around subtropical regions today. Or we could look at another region in the extreme northern part of the world, in northern Alaska, where frozen in ice have been found the remains of giant saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, animals which in, don't even exist today, existed in the past of subtropical varieties, and they were caught and frozen in these parts of the world suddenly and catastrophically. We could go to the Axel Heiberg Islands, again only a few hundred miles from the North Pole, where just a few years ago, scientists found the remains of redwood trees. Some of the stumps were six feet in diameter. They found the same kinds of observations. Well, there's also evidence that life grew larger in the past. For example, moss-like plants grew to over three feet in height. Or we could look at the great ferns of the past, grew 50 to 70 feet tall. Horsetail reeds of the past today only grow a matter of 18 inches to 2 feet tall. In the past, have been found in the fossil record 50 to 70 feet tall. Insects were much larger. Dragonflies have been found in the fossil record with wingspans over 3 feet. And cockroaches, 1 foot in diameter. Not only were the insects large, but the great Mollusks of the past were huge, nautiloids 9 to 12 feet in diameter. Today, their counterparts only a few inches. The great sloths of the past were 18 to 20 feet tall. Today, their counterparts about the size of a small monkey. Or the rhinos of the past were 17 feet tall, 32 feet in length. And you can see here, in comparison to the size of a man, they were giant creatures. Or we could look at the huge reptilian creatures of the past, the dinosaurs. They, too, were huge creatures. And as we'll mention a little later, it appears that they lived under these subtropical conditions literally from pole to pole. Dinosaurs, being reptilian creatures, each year that they lived grew larger and larger. And large dinosaurs were very likely just old dinosaurs that had grown many, many years to very large sizes. Another interesting factor of the creation account is given to us when we read about the genealogies of mankind. Man, living under this protected environment, before the time of the flood, lived to approximately 900 years old. And again, this is another confirmation to this particular model. Man, living under a protective canopied earth that was sheltered from harmful radiation, could live for long periods of time. Now, some people say, well, maybe a year then wasn't the same as a year today. Well, we have no reason to say that it was different today then in the past than it is today. Some say, well, maybe the days were different. Maybe a day is a million years. Well, the Bible tells us that each day was bounded by a morning and the evening. So the creationist account, based on a biblical view, is a creation that took place literally in literal days, not millions and millions of years ago, like we have been told from the evolutionary worldview, but much, much more recently. And as we'll see later in our presentations, there's reason to believe that the Earth is much younger than what we have been told from the evolutionary concepts. We could continue and look at some of the basic foundational principles of creation. According to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 9, and God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, 
and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So the water was together in one place. And if the water was together in one place, then we would expect the land mass was one as well. And when we look at geological maps, we are told that the original Earth was one large land mass. And scientists have given it the name Panagea. And it's interesting that most geologists who are evolutionists believe that the Earth was one large land mass in its original form but then broke apart and separated into the continental masses that we know today. They know that the layers of the Earth were laid down before the continents separated because the layers in South America, for example, and in Africa are the same layers. They're identical. They were laid down horizontally, and then at a later period of time, the Earth separated. And according to the biblical creationist account, the separation took place in the days of Peleg, who lived after the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25, we're told, in his days, God divided the earth, a sudden division of the land masses. Some creationists believe that this division took place towards the end of the flood, which we'll be describing later. But what we do know is that the continents separated after the layers were laid down. So sometime after the flood, this occurred. So we have the one large landmass breaking apart and separating into other landmasses. Then we move on to another very important principle of the creation model. That is the creation of life. According to the biblical account, God brought life into existence suddenly, and it was perfected. And God created this life on the third and the fifth and the sixth days of creation. It was not a process that took place over long periods of time. It occurred specifically on day, in certain days. And God, using the building blocks which he had created, formed life. Life came on the scene suddenly, fully completed. The reproduction, there has to be a male and a female. There has to be the reproductive organs to reproduce one half of a male and one half of a female, the sperm and the egg. God created all forms of life and if we look at living things we see that they are made up of organ systems which are necessary for the organism to survive. Specific organs have specific functions which the Creator designed. They did not happen by process of chance. Or if we look at various animals, we see that God coded them with instincts, that is, understanding information that didn't have to be learned. God literally programmed information into their brains so that perpetuation of life could occur from generation to generation. But the focal point of the creation account was the creation of mankind. God brought into existence the first man, Adam, and then the first woman, Eve. And again, the Bible tells us that they were perfect. God created the first man and the first woman so that he might have human beings that he might have a relationship with, a loving relationship. But he did not create them as robots. He created them with a free will so that they could choose whether or not they wanted to have this loving relationship with their creator. And the biblical account tells us that man made a choice not to have the relationship with the Creator because Satan came to the Garden of Eden in the embodiment of a serpent, enticed Eve to disobey God, to take of the particular tree, the forbidden tree that God had placed in the garden, and in so doing, shattered the relationship that man had with God, and the perfect creation then became imperfect. The fall of mankind triggered the fall of the creation, degeneration, mutations, and things then went downward, not upward. God was sorry, we were told in the scriptural biblical account, that he had made man after a period of time because the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually and the involvements of the things which they were doing. And so God warned this original generation of people that had 
developed generation after generation since the creation to turn to him and mankind refused and God brought a great global catastrophic judgment to the original creation. Now in order to understand the whole creation model it's important that we understand what took place during this great catastrophe. According to the biblical account in Genesis chapter 7 and chapter 8 the Bible says that God used his natural laws to bring a judgment to the earth. We're told first of all that the fountains of the great deep broke up. And with reference to this judgment it's referring to the earth's crust fracturing. And when the earth's crust fractures we have volcanic eruptions that occur. Molten magma coming out onto the surface of the earth, volcanic ash exuded into the environment, carbon dioxide, water coming up from within the earth onto the surface of the earth. And this event was taking place not in one or two little localized areas, but literally all over the planet, happening underneath the ocean beds and happening on the land masses as well a worldwide volcanic catastrophe. And so life forms were caught and buried in volcanic debris and fossilized through this great catastrophe. Secondly, the biblical account says that the windows of heaven were opened. There was a cosmic destruction which occurred. The Bible doesn't tell us how God did it, but obviously something fell upon the earth from above the earth perhaps asteroids, perhaps comets, perhaps both, but as a result, a worldwide catastrophe occurred as the windows of heaven were open, a cosmic destruction. And the water layer surrounding the earth, the biblical account says, came down in the form of torrential precipitation. And as a result, the rain which came down being one of the sources of the floodwaters caused a worldwide flood. The ocean beds rose and land masses sank and so the waters from the oceans were the second source of the floodwaters. And thirdly, the water coming out from within the earth through volcanic activity. And so eventually the entire surface of the earth was covered. It's possible that at this time there was ice deposition that occurred as well as we find all over the world animals that have been buried suddenly frozen catastrophically in ice with summer vegetation in their mouths. And regions that were once subtropical were totally devastated and changed and perhaps became ice polar caps in short periods of time. The Bible doesn't tell us this happened, but there's evidence throughout history that there have been icy catastrophic depositions that have occurred as a result of cosmic destructions. Eventually, the entire planet was covered in water. There were geological upheavals that were occurring as the land masses would rise. And as a result of the land masses rising, literally hundreds of cubic miles of water were quickly displaced, causing tremendous erosional forces, creating canyons in short periods of time. Tidal wave activity, waves swooping back and forth across the land mass mixing life forms together and as a result scrambling life and burying this life in flood deposited deposition. Many forms of life caught alive in swimming positions buried suddenly, other forms ripped and torn apart, disarticulated and laid down in stratas which were been formed by water activity. So the original earth was completely devastated. Now some people say, well, where do we find the humans? What happened to them? I believe that at this time, human civilization were living in cities. That's what the biblical account tells us in Genesis chapter 4. It says, and Cain built a city. So people were living in cities. And at this time when the great flood came, God literally destroyed these cities. And I believe that we're given some insight into what he did in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 26, the prophet Ezekiel is telling the people what is going to happen to the city of Tyre. And he's warning them that it's going to be something like what has happened in the past. In verse 19 of chapter 26, the 
prophet said, For thus says the Lord God, when I shall make you a desolate city, like the cities which are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep over you, and the great waters will cover you. Then I shall bring you down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old, and I shall make you dwell in the lower parts of the earth, like the ancient waste places, with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited. You see, in the past, God took cities, civilizations, and literally took them into the earth. And we've heard all kinds of legends and accounts of the lost, uh, lost continent of Atlantis or the lost continent of Mew. Yes, they are legends. But these legends are based upon accounts of ancient civilizations that believe that their ancestors were destroyed when the earth opened and they went down into the earth at a time of a great global catastrophe. And that is exactly what took place at this time. Only those that were in the ark, the human beings, and the various forms of life that God preserved survived this great catastrophe, as well as those animals or those uh, organisms that could survive in water. A worldwide catastrophe. The layers were formed as a result of a worldwide event. Now, a geologist who accepts the uniformitarian position when he looks at these layers of the earth, says that couldn't have happened by a catastrophe. It can only be explained by gradual processes which have occurred over long periods of time. And so over the past 200 years, the idea that the earth's layers were formed by catastrophe has been changed by a view which we call uniformitarianism. And incidentally, the, Peter says, in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, that in the last days, this philosophy of gradualism or uniformitarianism would be the belief of the day. And that's what evolution is based upon, is the idea of uniformitarianism. The belief is that the layers of the earth were not formed by catastrophe, but were formed over very long, long periods of time. That the earth has a history of billions of years of age, and that the layers that we see were formed very gradually over many, period, many years of time. Along with this idea is that life developed and progressed over long periods of time. Non-life became life and then developed from simple to complex. And so the idea is that we should be able to find the record of life developing through these layers of the earth over these long periods of time. And so in the 1800s, in the mid-1800s, a theory was put forward trying to explain why we have layers and the origin and history of life. And the chart that we're looking at here is called the geological chart. On the left-hand side are the various layers of the earth which have been drawn on the chart. At the bottom of the chart are layers which are supposed to be the oldest. And then as we go upward the chart, we, we are told that these layers are much younger until eventually we get to the top. These are the most recent layers. On the right-hand side of the chart, we are shown various forms of life, beginning with simple single-celled organisms at the bottom, and then progressing to become multicellular organisms. Clams appear, and then eventually they become fish, and then amphibians, and then reptiles, and then on up the scale to birds, mammals, and man. And so this chart is supposed to be an accurate representation explaining the age of the earth and the history of life during these long periods of time. Totally opposite the creationist biblical worldview. Now, this chart, which was constructed in the 1800s, is still used today to date layers of the earth and to date the fossils. And it's, it's used as a scale of measuring time and when certain kinds of life forms live. And it's based on some very serious assumptions which cannot be backed up and supported by the observable evidence. And it's really based on what we would call circular reasoning. The amazing thing is that this chart, as we see it here, cannot be found anywhere in the entire world, in the real world, in the geological layers, in the order and the sequence of life which we are shown. 
and yet it is claimed to be accurate. Now let me explain to you how the chart is used to date fossils and to date the ages of layers. It's done in what I would call a circular reasoning pattern. And to illustrate this, I want to explain to you how a certain farmer weighed his pig. He didn't have access to a modern scale. So he decided he would make his own scale, and he found a plank on the farm and a sawhorse. He placed the pig on one end of the plank, and then he searched around all over the farm until he found a rock that exactly balanced the pig. He was so excited that he had found this rock, because it took him a long time, that he decided that he would estimate the weight of the rock. And so he came up with an estimation. He was so confident that his estimation was accurate, he then went to market and he believed that he had determined the exact weight of the pig. Now that's circular reasoning. Why? Because he weighed the pig based upon a rock that balanced the pig that he had guessed at. Not scientific, simply estimation. Now, you might wonder, what does that have to do with dating fossils or layers? Well, geologists date fossils and layers in the same way that the farmer weighed his pig. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that you found a trilobite fossil, and you wanted to know how old it was. You went to a university with your trilobite in your hand, and you took it to the geologist and said, could you tell me how old is this fossil? Well, he would be able to tell you immediately. He would take you to the geological chart, and he would show you the trilobite on the chart. And he would say, oh, your trilobite is about 400 to 500 million years old. How did he know that? Well, you see, these dates were simply assumed, might I say guessed at, over 150 years ago. Now, you might want to know how old a layer is. And you find a particular layer, and you look at the layer, and if a geologist was with you, he would say, I can tell you how old the layer is. Let's find a fossil. And you would look carefully through the layer until you found a fossil. And then you would take the fossil to the geological chart and look and find the fossil. And then you would immediately know how old the layer is. Now, do you see the problems here? This chart was simply arbitrarily estimated or guessed at. No one was there in the past to watch these layers being formed. No one knows how long it takes to lay down one of these layers. And I can tell you that the sequence of life that we see here doesn't exist anywhere in the entire world. There are some major problems with the evolutionary worldview on the history of life based on the geological column. Now what we want to do in this latter part of our presentation is to show you how layers and fossils are found. We're going to look at the observable evidence. First of all, we might ask the question, well, how do we know how long it takes to lay down a particular layer? If this is going to be scientific, we should be able to be on location and make observations. Well, obviously, we can't do that about things that have happened in the past. But we do know today that layers can be formed rather quickly. It doesn't necessarily take millions of years of time. And I refer to a recent catastrophe that occurred in northwestern United States when Mount St. Helens erupted. A great catastrophe took place on a localized scale. And you remember what we saw. Trees were ripped off the mountain, and they were swept down the slopes and buried in volcanic debris. But what most people have not been told is that during this catastrophe, after geologists went in and observed the destruction, found that layers were formed in just a matter of a few minutes during this great catastrophe. And standing here on top of this particular cliff, Dr. John Morris of the Institute of Creation Research, do you realize that this location has to cause us to question our conventional views on how layers can be formed? So it doesn't take millions and millions of years of time to form layers. And in the same location, great canyons were carved out 
again in the matter of minutes or hours. It does not take millions of years to form canyons by erosional processes during a catastrophe. Now, speaking of canyons, we have one of the greatest canyons on the Earth's surface here in the United States, the Grand Canyon. And it is also composed of layers. And when we look at the layers that make up the Grand Canyon, geologists will admit the layers were laid down by water activity. Well, they say it took place millions and millions of years of time as oceans came in and then gradually left. And there was just gradual sedimentation that took place over millions of years. How do we know? Who was there and made these observations? We look at the canyon, and today we're told that it was formed as a result of the Colorado River just trickling through there over these millions and millions of years of time. How do we know that that happened? The walls of the canyon are very vertical. Perhaps there was a sudden erosional force that occurred, and today some geologists think that inland United States was drained suddenly to the Pacific Ocean when fissures of the earth opened up and water drained through these cracks and created a great canyon in short periods of time. I believe that that could have taken place. We could look at some other features of the earth which indicate to us that the geological column has some problems. For example, we could go to this mountain here in Canada called Mount Yumnuska. It is a mountain that is literally upside down. By that I mean that the top layer here belongs to one of the oldest layers in the geological column, the Cambrian. And it's on the top of the mountain. And underneath this top layer, starting here where the sloping occurs, is a layer called the Cretaceous, based upon the fossils that are found in it. This layer is supposed to be 500 million years old. This layer is only 200 million years old. Now, how do you get the old layer on top of the young layer? Well, that's very easy. We're told that the old layer shifted up vertically over millions of years of time and then gradually went horizontally over top of the younger layer. But when you climb up and you examine the transition between the old layer, the Cambrian, and the younger layer, the Cretaceous, there's a coal seam that separates the two. And there's no evidence that this mountain shifted the old over, the, over the younger. In fact, there are literally hundreds of thousands of square miles like this all over northern Canada and the northern United States. The column is not found the way we are told that it's found. Or we might ask the question, well, how do we have fossils formed? Is there any mechanism today that we can study that shows us how this occurred? And believe me, all over the world, there are billions and billions of fossils which indicate that in the past, life was buried suddenly. That's how you have fossils. Today, if a fish dies, it rots. If a frog dies, it rots. If a mammal dies, it rots. You see, in the past, there were some different conditions because we have all kinds of fossils of fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and they're buried suddenly and catastrophically. All over the world, we have clams with their valves shut. They have been buried alive. All over the world, we have fish buried in swimming positions, every detail perfectly preserved. We have amphibians. We have reptiles showing us that they have been suddenly and catastrophically buried alive. Not just in local catastrophes, because these are all over the planet. Something has happened in the past which has destroyed life. There are polystrate fossils around the world which indicate that trees, for example, have been buried suddenly. This particular one here, partway through a coal seam, which is supposed to have taken hundreds of millions of years to form. And then a sandstone layer, which is supposed to have taken hundreds of millions of years to form. How do you get a tree to stand there that long and fossilize? <laughs> some catastrophe has obviously occurred which has buried and destroyed life. We find all over the world the remains of dinosaurs buried, some in swimming positions, some with their bones ripped and torn apart, disarticulated, fragments of dinosaur bones buried in layers that have been laid down by water activity. It's interesting when we look at dinosaurs 
and especially artist representations of the conditions that they lived in, we see that they were surrounded usually by subtropical vegetation. And usually artists represent volcanoes in the background. Why is that? Because dinosaurs are found literally from pole to pole, buried with subtropical vegetation and volcanic materials. Now that's interesting, especially in light of the biblical creationist model. Because according to this view, dinosaurs lived under this canopied earth in subtropical conditions and were wiped out by a catastrophe which involved volcanic activity and a cosmic destruction. And some of the newest theories on dinosaur extinction say dinosaurs were wiped out by a worldwide event involving volcanism and a cosmic destruction. But most geologists would totally reject the view that this could have been a global flood. Here in Alberta, Canada, in Dinosaur Provincial Park, in this particular region, I was there several years ago doing some film documentary work on dinosaurs. In this region, over 300 dinosaurs have been found, many of them bones pulled apart, but they believe that they drowned in this one location. I asked the geologist, how is it possible that so many dinosaurs could have drowned in this one location? He said, well, there was a local flood here. And what happened during the flood season, the river was running very high, and one dinosaur was attempting to cross the river, and he tripped and drowned. The second one that was following him tripped over him, and he drowned. The third over the first two, eventually 300 tripped over each other and drowned in the same location <laughs> in a local flood. But you can go to Montana, and they'll tell you the same thing. There was a local flood in Montana, or the same in Utah, or the same in Brazil, or the same in Mongolia. Anywhere around the world, geologists will admit there were local floods that killed the dinosaurs. But if someone suggests that perhaps maybe this was a global event, then one is considered to be a religious fanatic who is trying to support a biblical view. But you see, no one was there in the past. How do we know that there could not have been a worldwide catastrophic event? The evidence points that way very clearly. Worldwide, we do not only find dinosaurs buried in these flood-deposited conditions, and as I mentioned, in some cases, the dinosaurs are literally in swimming positions. In Mongolia, they've been found standing in quicksand, buried suddenly. In most cases, their bones have been torn apart, and they're mixed together with wood and, and even other fossils of other animals. And today, we see the remains of dinosaurs in museums fully articulated, all of the bones put together. But that's very seldom. They even find a good portion of a dinosaur in one place. They're torn apart. Worldwide, we find life forms buried in volcanic materials. And we find all kinds of volcanic material around the world. For example, in a region surrounding the Hudson's Bay of Canada, here, very large bay which some people today believe was created when a large asteroid or meteorite slammed in the Earth. We see surrounding it in this red area here is just a map showing an outflow of magma that has occurred in the past as molten materials have come out of the Earth, inside of the Earth, onto the Earth. And we find huge masses of lava flows literally all over the world. And various kinds of fossils are buried in them and fossilized. Here in the Yellowstone Park in northern United States, we find large trees, redwood trees, on the high peaks of the mountains, which have been buried in volcanic breccia. And the trees have been turned from organic, that is living, to stone. They've been fossilized because they've been buried in this volcanic material. Or we can go to the petrified forest in Arizona. Some people would like to rename this the petrified log jam because that's what it looks like. These trees have been flooded in. And they're huge, giant trees. Some of them are two to 300 feet in length. And you'll notice that they are buried in volcanic materials, which has been laid down by water activity, flood deposition. And this area looks something very similar to what we would have observed after Mount St. Helens had erupted. So life forms have been buried worldwide. We can go to the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains, where those that have been there see so many different animals and so many different varieties, they say it looks like life was wiped out and destroyed all at one time. 
Well, if it looks that way, maybe it was. And that's what the Bible says happened. But evolutionists refuse to admit that such a catastrophe could have occurred. We could go to the Love Bone Beds in Archer, Florida. A number of years ago, in an excavation about the size of a gymnasium, over one million fossils were found. Many different varieties, and this particular article tells us that to find so many fossils all in one place is literally incredible. It's unbelievable. It says that life must have been very rich and productive in this location. Now, what they found there were marine organisms and freshwater organisms, plants and animals, all scrambled together. In order to describe it, they say a freshwater stream flowed lazily from the north into a saltwater marsh. You see, for years, evolutionists did not want to admit catastrophe, so they had to explain these fossil beds as having formed very gradually over long periods of time. The article goes on to tell us some of the creatures that they have found there. Land animals that have been found include snakes, rodents of various kinds, two species of raccoon, four species of wolves, a saber-toothed cat, an elephant, a tapir, two species of rhinos, seven kinds of horses, a llama, three species of camels. And then it states, the climate looks to have been even more tropical and lush than Florida today. You see, mixed together with alligators and turtles and fish were all of these other forms of life, mammals, buried in a condition, they say, that looked to have been more tropical than Florida today. You see, that agrees with this biblical creationist perspective as well. We could go to the Axel Heiberg Islands once more and show you that these layers that they find just a few hundred miles from the North Pole, layers that contain redwood trees, that contain vegetation that looks like it could have come out of the Florida Everglades, were laid down by some kind of a watery deposition, it tells us, the island's forests, or the ancient forests, owe their remarkable preservation to the broad floodplain in which they grew. You mean these trees and these life forms were buried by a flood? That's what it tells us. And they tell us that in this time that this happened, rivers meandered through swampy forests carrying the sediments and eroded from a mountain range in the west. Every so often, floodwaters rose above the banks and deposited thick layers of sand and silt. Instead of being washed away, the leaf litter was sealed with a cover of the sediments that prevented the trees, and they were covered over in flood deposition. Flood deposition. All over the world, flood deposition. Animals buried, plants buried, catastrophically, not gradually. You do not get fossils formed by gradual processes. And finally, we could go to the trilobite beds. In Field, British Columbia, on the high peaks of the mountains near Field, British Columbia, in the layers called Cambrian because of the fossils that they contain, trilobites are found. Not only trilobites, but many, many complex, multicellular forms of life found mixed together with the trilobites a very famous location where many people have made observations. But in this particular article, we are told that there's something amazing that has been discovered. In a Vancouver Sun newspaper, this statement was made. Because so many forms of life appear in the, one of the oldest layers, they are starting to reevaluate some of their ideas regarding evolution. And the statement is made, the textbook evolutionary tree, with everything traced back to a few common ancestors, is inaccurate. Instead, evolution is a thicket with a rich diversity of species in the remote past. Now let me repeat what they said. The evolutionary tree, with everything traced back to a common ancestor, is inaccurate. Now I'm not quoting to you out of the Bible and Science newsletter, or the Institute of Creation Research Acts and Facts. This is a secular newspaper. And they're telling us that this tree, the Darwinian tree, 
of life is inaccurate. It doesn't exist. Now we should make some observations. If this doesn't exist, then why is it that today in California, we are being told that evolution is the basis of all science? And that in order to present science in the classroom, only evolution can be presented. It's the only factual, observable worldview that's credible. There's some problems. You see, we don't think for ourselves anymore in our generation. It's amazing what's taking place in the Soviet Union. While I was there, I was invited to speak to professors, educators, regarding biblical creation. Because they have come to realize a long time ago that Darwinian evolution was bankrupt. But you see, they were not able to talk about creation because it was illegal. In fact, if you talked about God or creation, they sent you off to the gulag. But now, freedom of thought, you can talk about creation, and that's exactly what they're doing. But here in California, we're going the other direction. Now, in our next presentation, we're going to deal with these foundational principles of evolution and to see whether or not they can be backed up by supportable evidence. Tonight, as I conclude, I want to turn to the book of Job. And I want to read a few verses from Job, which I believe are in line with what we have been doing this evening. The Bible challenges us to think for ourselves. In Job chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible says this, But now ask, ask the beasts, and let them teach you. So we should go out and we should look at living things. Look at the animals. Look at the creatures. They will teach. It goes on to say, and the birds of the heaven, and, tell, and let them tell you, or speak to the earth, and let it teach you. Look at the layers of the earth. Examine them, and to see what they tell us. And verse 8 continues. And let the fish of the sea declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And verse 10. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. You see, that's what Paul told those in his day that didn't believe in God the Creator. They believed that everything was God. They were worshiping the heavens, the moon, the earth, the sun as God. And he said to them, on Mars Hill, you're religious, but you're worshiping the wrong things. Worship the unknown God. He is the one who created you, who gave you breath, who gave you life. In verse 11, does not the ear test words as the palate tastes its food? You see, just as your mouth can taste food and determine what is good or what is not, so God has given you a brain, a mind, and you can look at the evidence, and you can examine the evidence, and you can make decisions. And your decision is very simple. Either God did it, or evolution did it. Two choices, creation or evolution. You see, I believe that the biblical creationist account can be backed up by the evidence. I believe that you can be a Christian and you can actually have your head screwed onto your shoulders because there's supportable evidence to support what the Bible says you can believe. What the Bible says about physical things can be supported by the evidence. And what the Bible says about spiritual things is also true. That is that you and I have a need for a Redeemer, Jesus Christ. You can believe the Bible. It's true about creation. It's true about the creation of man. It's true about the fall of man and the separation of man from God. And it's true about the offer that God made for you and I. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, to this earth 
And he lived a perfect life for us. That if we would accept that sacrifice that he made for you and I, that we could once again have a relationship with him, the creator, the creator of all things. The Bible, the creation model, it's true. And Jesus Christ is the creator, and he is a reality. 